Hi everybody and welcome back. So you'll notice in today's vlog that I'm a bit croaky and a bit sniffly and I have a cold because it's that time of year and for us as GPs it's almost inevitable that we're not going to get one because we're meeting so many. So that made me decide on the topic for today's vlog which is coughs and colds in children and I'm doing it because children get many more colds than us and it can be a really worrying time for parents especially in this day and age with all of the horror stories that we're able to see on the news and in the newspapers. And so I thought it would be a great idea to talk through what to expect, what you can do to try and help, and when to worry. So here goes. So from toddlers all the way through to teenagers, children will get more colds than adults. And that's because their immune system is immature and it's learning, it's learning how to do its job. So every time it meets a germ that it hasn't met before, it melts a response which we see as a cold and then next time hopefully that germ won't turn into a cold when the child or teenager meets it. And that's why adults get fewer coughs and colds in children because we've met lots of these germs already so our body knows how to deal with them. Now the really bad news is that toddlers will get up to 10 colds, coughs, colds, viruses, bacteria infections a year and when you consider that they generally get less in summer that also means that in winter they can literally go from one to another, getting up to two to three colds a month. So it can be a really difficult time for everyone in the house, including the child of course, who can be miserable. So let's start with fever, I think, because fever is the, the symptom that parents come to talk to me about most often. And I think there's a general conception out there that a fever is bad and a fever means that it's more serious and that's not actually the case although a higher fever can indicate that it's a bacterial infection rather than a viral infection but still not absolutely. So fever is really really common and most children will get a fever when they've got some kind of infection and it's actually their body doing its job so fighting whatever the infection is and that causes a fever. So in itself it's not a problem. It often gets higher at night and it also comes and goes so one day they won't have it and then it'll be back again. Also it can last for quite some time, more than the three days that I know you will all have read on the bottles of paracetamol and Nurofen that you buy where it says if the fever lasts for more than three days see a doctor. Fevers often last for more than three days so the fever in itself isn't harmful and evidence suggests that bringing the fever down doesn't actually change the chance of a child having a seizure from a high temperature. So febrile seizures, that's what they're called, are actually really quite rare and bringing the temperature down doesn't seem to change it. So what I always say to parents is treat the child, not the thermometer. So if the child's got a temperature of 39 and they're running around the room as happy as Larry, leave them alone. If however they've got a temperature of 39 and they're lethargic and miserable because it really can make them feel like that, then treat it just to make them feel more comfortable for no other reason. So in terms of what you can do to help with the fever, sorry, as I said, using paracetamol and Nurofen um, to actually bring the fever down is a good idea if the child is feeling rubbish with it. And if you need to, you can use both of those together or you can stagger them so that you've got something on board every three hours or so. So for example, you can give paracetamol at nine o'clock, then Nurofen at 12, then paracetamol at three and so on. As long as you don't exceed four doses of paracetamol and three doses of Nurofen in a 24 hour period, that's absolutely fine to do. Don't overwrap the child, so make sure they're not all wrapped up because that would just make it more difficult for them to lower their own body temperature. So let them run around in a vest and a nappy if that's what, what's needed. Now some parents like to bathe a child in lukewarm water or sponge them down. And whilst this isn't harmful, and sometimes it can help, it can actually sometimes make the child a little bit distressed because they're not really sure what's going on and the water's not that comfortable. So only do it if the child isn't getting distressed. And this is where your judgement as a parent comes into it because you know what your child will and won't tolerate. Keep them well hydrated. So even if they're not eating, just make sure that they're drinking plenty. And, and obviously one sign that they're drinking plenty is that they're still peeing properly because it means the body isn't having to conserve water. Because they're sweaty, they're gonna be losing fluid and that's why hydration helps because it helps replace the fluid that they lose through sweating. Now, 
if they were unlucky enough to have a febrile seizure, it's massively scary and it really is. And if you've never seen it before and it's your child, that just adds to the distress that it's going to cause you and obviously the child. So if it's the first time that your child's had a febrile seizure, make sure that they're safe in an area where they're not going to hurt themselves on anything. Don't be tempted to put your fingers in their mouth. Keep them on their side if you can and call 999. And that's really important. Most of the time, the seizure won't last more than five minutes and no harm will come to the child. Some parents whose children have these seizures are so used to them that they don't always call 999 anymore. But if it's the first time that your child has had a seizure, please do that. It's a most appropriate call. Okay, so alongside fevers, what do we get? Well, we quite often get colds. And a cold is the commonest, as you can tell by me today winter illness that you're going to see in your children. They're going to school, they're going to nursery and they're sharing. So five in ten children will get over their colds within about ten days. In actual fact nine out of ten will get over their colds within fifteen days. But I think both of those figures are longer than most people expect a cold should last. So don't think because it isn't getting better within a few days that it's anything more sinister. That's the natural lifespan of a common cold in a child and an adult actually. So tips that I would give to help them get through a cold, because again it will make them feel miserable, is go for the over-the-counter decongestions that can go on their pillows, for example, so I think Olbass oil, Vicks, etc. But make sure you get the right range for your age group, because not all of them can have everything. Just to help them breathe at night when it's more difficult for them, when their nose is blocked. And on this particular point, babies, for example, can only breathe through their nose. They're called obligate nose breathers. So this means that when their nose is full of snot and yuckiness, they can't feed anymore because they can't breathe through their mouth apart from when they're crying and their nose is blocked. So then you've got other problems coming in where they don't keep hydrated. So it's really, really important that you help a baby breathe through its nose. So saline drops will help do this. You can get them over in any chemist and you just, just before they're going to feed, drops and drops into their nasal pack. I can't speak because of this cold, into their nasal passages to just clear some of the snot away and then feed them. And one of the best tips I can give as well is to feed little and often because it's going to block up again quite soon. So just keep on with the saline nasal drops and little and often and that way you're keeping them hydrated as well. And again, just as in with the fever, paracetamol and Nurofen as needed to just help them with any pain, discomfort or fever. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we're going to talk about coughs or chesty coughs. So all colds can often be accompanied by coughs but sometimes they can come on their own and not be accompanied by a cold at all and that's just a different form of um, germ that they've met. It doesn't mean anything more sinister. It's often worse at night, which can be quite distressing for the whole family because everybody becomes sleep deprived as well, which doesn't help you and it doesn't help baby. Because baby's chests are much smaller and their airways are much smaller and their ribcage is much thinner than an adult's, quite often they'll sound rattly or wheezy, especially at night time, and that can be quite scary. More often than not, all of the muck is coming from the nasal passages and just sitting on their throat. In the daytime, because they're sitting, standing and walking, they'll swallow most of it, so it's not quite so bothersome. But at night time, because they're lying down, they can't swallow it. So it sits there, it makes them cough, it wakes them up and it sounds quite rattly. And that's often why these coughs are worse at night. It's very, very rarely a proper chest infection or a lower respiratory tract infection. And the doctor can quite often tell that from just listening to their chest to see where the noise is and where it's coming from. Five out of ten children's cough will get better within ten days. Nine out of ten will get better in fifteen days, but that's quite a long time if you think about it. It's over two weeks. And the really bad news is that some of these coughs can actually persist for up to six weeks quite normally. And when you consider that they might be having two different infections in a month, they can almost go through winter with a constant cough. So the best thing to do is try and find ways to make them comfortable at night. So my tips for this are to put some books under the legs of the cot or the bed so that the whole bed or cot is at an incline. Make sure you sleep with their feet to the end of the bed so they can't wiggle down, which is the way we should be sleeping all babies now to avoid cot death. And this way, it will just help them swallow a bit of that mucus and make it less bothersome for them at night time. 
It's no good putting them up on a pillow because they'll just wriggle off. So lift the whole bed. Sometimes it's useful to put a wet flannel over a radiator in their room in the evening when they go to sleep to create some steam and just hydrate their airways, which can become very dry. Just as mine are right now. And talking of steam, you can take a baby or a toddler into a bathroom, shut the door, turn the shower on absolute maximum heat and run it, not with anyone in it obviously, and let the room fill up with steam and just play with them in there for a little while so that they're breathing the steam in and out. It just kind of acts as a decongestion to break up some of the muck that's making them cough. <coughs> Sorry. And then just talking about that phlegm and snot that's making them cough, it's quite normal for it to accompany any cough or cold. The colour of it isn't really relevant, it doesn't indicate that it's bacterial or viral. When you consider that most of it's actually coming from the nasal passages, it's quite normal for it to be greeny yellow and very thick and mucousy. So that's all I wanted to say about snot because it's what's causing all of our problems at this point in time. Okay, so it's time to touch on earache because earache can be one of the most distressing things you see in a child. Certainly when my son was about five actually, I had the worst time ever with an ear infection with him just because of the distress that it caused him and he was inconsolable. Now, as much as this pain is the worst thing for them obviously and for you having to watch it, most ear infections don't need treatment and they will get better on their own. You should see your GP if you've got discharge coming out of the child's ear, particularly if it's both sides or if you think hearing is affected. But in the main, five out of 10 ear infections will clear within three days and nine out of 10 will be better within seven days. So again, antibiotics aren't necessary in most cases. In fact, 14 out of 15 children won't need antibiotics for an ear infection. Tips that I can give for an ear infection, lots of hugs and kisses and cuddles on the sofa and make sure you've got that pain relief on board, probably both paracetamol and Nurofen for an ear infection and regularly so that they are as comfortable as you can possibly make them. Now in terms of a sore throat or even tonsillitis, again most of them will get better on their own. Six out of ten sore throats will resolve within three days. Large tonsils in children are actually quite normal and on their own are not an issue that's worrying. If a child however is very unwell for more than three days, doesn't have a cough and has a very high temperature, see your GP for assessment. White spots on the tonsils is tonsillitis. Now it doesn't mean necessarily that they will need antibiotics but there is a scoring system called Centaur and if you score three out of four or more on Centaur then there might be an indication for antibiotics. But just so you know the evidence for tonsillitis and antibiotics is this. You need eight tablets a day, quite a strong antibiotic, a penicillin, for 10 days. And all that's been shown to do is reduce the duration of the tonsillitis by nine to 16 hours. Now, bear in mind that one in five people get side effects from antibiotics, like an upset tummy, a rash. You have to consider way up the pros and cons of that. But certainly, more than three days, a very high temperature, no cough. See your GP for assessment. Now, croup. I've seen a few cases of creep this year already. It generally affects six months to 12 year old, 12 months old, sorry. And it's most common in under three year olds. It is a virus and it produces a very distinctive barking cough. But I've popped a video into the comments afterwards for you to, see, to listen and see what croup sounds like. It's often worse at night and nighttime children with croup quite often have difficulty breathing. They need lots of cuddles and calm because anxiety actually makes croup worse and they'll be anxious because they're struggling to breathe. So it's trying to settle them down and break that cycle and to keep them very well hydrated. But, and I'm gonna put a big but about this, if they're breathing too quickly, so count the number of breaths and I'm gonna put a table in afterwards for how quickly children breathe at different ages because it changes as they get older. Count the number of breaths per minute and if they're breathing too fast, if they're working too hard to breathe, so if the muscles 
the skin between the ribs at the side here are sucking in. If they're sucking in here, this is called tracheal tug, or if they're sucking in under their rib cage here, that could mean they're working too hard to breathe and they get tired really quickly, so they might need some support. If they're just really, really agitated and distressed by it, or if they look exhausted because they're working so hard to breathe, they've got bluish around their lips, or they're dribbling and drooling and can't swallow, please seek urgent medical help. Because although croup is a virus, they sometimes need some steroids to calm down the airways and some support with oxygen, etc. So they're not working so hard to breathe. Have a look at the video afterwards. Loss of appetite and drinking is really common when children are ill. And the most important thing to know is that children can survive without food for quite a few days, but they can't survive without fluid. So that's the most important thing. And that's why we always ask about drinking and peeing as GPs. So give them small sips often, that's the best way to do it. Babies need at least 50% of their normal fluid intake and once they drop below that, they're probably not gonna be well hydrated enough. One of the ways to tell is, are they wetting nappies? Are they peeing? Because if they're not, you need to seek urgent medical help. They might be weeing less than normal, but it's important that they are because it means their kidneys are still working and they have enough fluid on board. Have a look at their mouth. Is their mouth very dry? Are their eyes sunken? Are they drowsy? Any of those things when they're not drinking much, seek urgent medical help. So obviously the question that we get asked the most is, will antibiotics help? Well, the most important thing to know is that 14 out of 15 childhood illnesses will get better without antibiotics. And it's part of the normal building of their immune system. Antibiotics build resistance in the community. And we see a lot of stories at the moment that in time to come, we won't be able to have operations or kidney transplants because we won't have antibiotics left that we can use. So it's important for all of us not to overuse them. Side effects from antibiotics affect one in five people. And this is another reason why we don't necessarily need to use them. So we're talking about things like vomiting, diarrhea, tummy pains, skin rashes, and allergies. And also it wipes out our gut bacteria. And we know from my other blogs that gut bacteria is really important in helping us remain healthy and not develop disease. And lots of children have allergic reactions to, to antibiotics. So, as most people don't need them, it's best not to have them, as distressing as it is for you to want to try and help. So, when should you worry? Well, obviously there are times when you should worry. It's not all plain sailing all of the time, and I'm not naive enough to believe that. So if your child is really drowsy or irritable, and that that doesn't improve when you give them paracetamol or ibuprofen, so it's not being caused by the temperature, or if they're difficult to rouse, that's a warning sign to seek help. If they have breathing problems that I've described with signs that show that they're working hard to breathe, they're short of breath or they're rapid, that's a problem. If they have a seizure, seek help. If a baby is not feeding at least 50% of their normal feed or not wetting nappies, that's important. If they're dehydrated, so sunken eyes, the fontanelle in the head of a baby here, which is the hole in the skull, if that's sunken in, if they have a dry mouth, no tears, or they generally look unwell, then seek help. If they had cold hands or feet, but their body is warm, that's important. If their skin colour changes, if they're dusky, blue, pale around the lips, or mottled, and they're not normally like that, then that's obviously a warning sign. And if they get any rash that you're worried about, it's always important to just check it out to make sure that it is normal. So in terms of rashes, the things that people are often worried about is meningitis, and that's a justifiable worry. First thing to know, it's very, very rare. So the things you're looking for for meningitis is a stiff neck. Can the child put their chin on their chest? Or is their neck really immovable? Do they have an unusually bad headache and they won't tolerate light? Do they have a, a, a rash, sorry, do they have a rash that when you run your finger over it, it doesn't disappear? Or when you run a glass over it, press the glass, it stays there? All of these are warning signs for meningitis. So if they have any of those, 
then seek urgent medical help. So I hope that's helped and given you some tips. And it is a horrible time as a parent. I've been through it and I, I accept that. I'm going to put some information in the descriptions afterwards. I'm going to put normal vital signs for children so you can check how fast they're breathing, what their pulse is, etc. I'm going to put some videos so that you can see what a child's chest looks like when it's working too hard to breathe and what croup sounds like. And hopefully all of these things will help. I'm also going to put a, a link to a leaflet called When Should I Worry so that you've got all of the information that I've mentioned today at hand and you don't have to keep watching my vlog. So I hope that's been helpful but if you've got any questions please ask them in the questions afterwards. I will always answer and thanks for watching as always and I'll see you in a couple of weeks time.